Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so tonight, I'm going to set it up just a little bit different. Uh, I tried recording this last time, just audio, and uh, failed miserably. So we're going to actually use our uh, live stream camera system to do it. And so uh, I'm actually going to move up, which means if you want to, I would prefer to be as close to you as possible. So if you'd like to move up closer to me, I cannot move closer to you. Uh, so if you want to, as, as comfortable as you are to move up, that'd be great. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 12 through 50. And uh, as we do that, there's a whole lot of material to cover. And uh, I was talking... Uh, earlier with Melissa, just trying to uh, think through what's, what's the best way to, to get through this material, because um, I, I could spend a lot of time giving kind of general overviews, and because we're going through the entire Old Testament in one semester, I don't want to just spend time overviewing everything. Uh, I'd really like to give some more time to uh, discussion questions, as well as um, looking at some passages that might prove a little bit difficult in our understanding of the Old Testament and uh, how the Bible fits together and how the Old Testament fits with the New. And so I'm going to try and take a little bit different tactic. We're still going to overview kind of the content of, uh, of Genesis 12 through 50 or Exodus as we're going to do next week and so on and so forth. But what I'd like to do is spend some time discussing the questions particularly that might be on your mind and looking at those passages that might prove a little, little bit difficult uh, in terms of their interpretation. So to give kind of a blanket summary of where we've gone so far, we looked at the Old Testament uh, in terms of its uh, historical context. We looked at kind of the range of the Old Testament in the first class, uh, its composition, the different sections of the Old Testament. Last week, or two weeks ago rather, we looked at Genesis 1 through 11, and we talked about how uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is so fascinating because it gives us this universal history with God at the very beginning, uh, but it leads us all the way to the time of Abraham. Uh, which is very interesting because, of course, this is Israelite literature, and yet it doesn't begin with Israel. It begins at the very beginning of the world. And so uh, wrapped up in this story of Abraham and the story of Israel itself is this idea that the, the destiny of the world is somehow tied into the family of Abram and all of his descendants. Um, and yet what we saw is this incredible beginning in Genesis 1 where God creates the world perfect and very good. Uh, but by the time you get to Genesis 6 and then Genesis 9 after the flood in 10 and 11, you see this descent into sin where sin is like a disease that infects things so quickly that the perfect world that God created very quickly becomes corrupted so that God is grieved that he even created humanity in Genesis 6. You have a reset in Genesis 10 uh, that kind of sets the stage for Genesis 11 and 12 that we're going to be going into tonight. So it's just always important, and this is true not just in the book of Genesis, but in the Old Testament as a whole, to remember that the original world as God created it is no more. And, and everything that we see, and we're going to talk about this by the time we get to the end tonight, everything we see in the rest of the book of Genesis and in the rest of the Old Testament, our understanding has to be that this is a fallen world. God is dealing with humanity in a fallen condition. And, uh, and, and it's important for us to remember that so that we don't fall into the error of saying that, that when God does something or interacts with someone, that, that he's condoning their behavior in its totality. Okay. In other words, there is always going to be the stain of, stain of sin in the backdrop of everything that happens in the rest of the Old Testament. And yet God is working to redeem as we're going to see today. So today is Genesis 12 through 50. And what I want us to do uh, as we think about the story of the patriarchs, okay? So this is the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons. Um, as we think about this, I want to first look a little bit at Genesis 1 through 11 verses or in contrast to uh, Genesis 12 through 50. So uh, this is just to, to get in your mind uh, that, that it's not an arbitrary dividing point, that there really is a, a pretty big difference between Genesis 1 through 11 and Genesis 12 through 50. So, better turn my clicker on or else it's not going to go. Okay, so here I want us to briefly look at Genesis 1 through 11, and this is something we talked about in, in uh, last time. Genesis 1 through 11 deals with universal history, or it deals with all humanity. 
Uh, so you have Adam, you have all of Adam's sons, you then uh, narrow it down to Noah. Uh, but then after Noah, you have kind of this table of nations in Genesis 10, so it deals with all of humanity. Genesis 1 through 11, in a very short period of time, or a very short uh, amount of space, covers millennia of history, okay? You have all the way from before anything was created, and you go through thousands of years in a matter of a few chapters, okay? In contrast, over here in Genesis 12 through 50, rather than it being universal humanity, it focuses on one family, and rather than taking millennia, it has approximately, uh, it takes place over a period of approximately 200 years or just a few generations, three or four generations, uh, granted that they're longer generations. The pace of the narrative, Genesis 1 through 11, again, you're going fast, 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 fast. One generation to the next. In, a, in, in, one, in one chapter in Genesis 5, you go through seven generations, okay? So it happens very fast in Genesis 1 through 11, but Genesis 12 through 50 slows down. You get to walk with Abraham all the way from Ur of the Chaldeans, all the way to the promised land. Then you go down to Egypt, then you come back. It's very slow in terms of the narrative as opposed to Genesis 1 through 11. The pace is very fast. Uh, in terms of style, there's a drastic style difference. So uh, if you look at Genesis 1 through 11, very little dialogue. Okay, God talks to Cain, God talks to Noah just a little bit. Noah doesn't really talk back. But when it comes to Genesis 12 through 50, you have all of this dialogue. You've got God talking to Abram. You have Abram talking back to God. You have Jacob talking to God and, and giving vows. It's very different in terms of style. There's a lot of dialogue, okay? Uh, location. When it comes to Genesis 1 through 11, you start out with the garden, but really it's, it's a scope in, in, in terms of location of the entire earth. There's a flood that fills the entire earth. In the table of nations, they spread out upon the entire earth. But Genesis 12 through 50 is primarily located in Palestine, in Canaan, okay? And then they go down to Egypt for a little while, and, and of course that's big in the Joseph narrative, but it's basically the promised land in Egypt. Uh, and this last point is uh, that Genesis 1 through 11 has really several parallels to other ancient Near Eastern stories or texts, whereas Genesis 12 through 50 really doesn't have any other ancient Near Eastern parallel. And I want to just focus on that for, uh, for just a minute. There is no parallel account in ancient Near Eastern cultures to the story of Abraham. It's very unique. Other, other cultures don't have kind of like a father of a faith that produces a people that then spread and multiply because God has blessed them. That's a unique Israelite trait. Uh, and, and that's important because, again, some of the things we see in Genesis 1 through 11, you have other versions of the flood story. Or you have other versions of the creation story. But Genesis 12 through 50 is so different. And here's why. And this is, please don't miss this. Other cultures did not see their gods, quote unquote, as having, desiring, or caring about personal relationships with people. That's what makes it so unique, is that God enters into a special relationship with Abraham, and you get to see it unfold. And through that relationship, taking a step further, you get to see God's character unfold through the way that he treats Abraham and his descendants. So, Genesis 1 through 11, incredibly important, foundational. Genesis 12 through 50, it's a different kind of world. And when I say that, here's the thing that we need to remind ourselves of. The brokenness of the world becomes evident in Genesis 12 through 50 in a way that we don't get to see in Genesis 1 through 11. Here's what I mean, okay? Genesis 1 through 11 describes sin as kind of a universal power. Okay, it's like a disease that infects everything so that it says in Genesis 6, all the inclinations of the thought of the heart of man are only evil continually. Human depravity on a universal scale. But what you don't see in Genesis 1 through 11 is how that personally impacts families or how that impacts decision-making of individuals or you don't see the level of brokenness on kind of an individual perspective you see it on a universal perspective. Everyone's very evil, Genesis 1 through 11. Genesis 12 through 50, let's look at how this evil impacts the way people live in the real world. So that Genesis 12 through 50 kind of reads like a Jerry Springer Marathon, okay? 
You've got a man who's old and his wife, they can't have kids, so she gets a slave so that the slave can have kids with the master. The slave is then mistreated. God promises the woman to have a son. They have a son. That person then marries his cousin. Okay, that's a little bit weird. And then they come back and then wait a minute, they have a kid, but they have two kids. Those two kids get in a fight. Those two kids mo both have multiple wives. There's favorite wives, there's favorite kids. Then they want to kill the favorite. I mean, this is literally what it is. This is the story of Genesis 12 through 50. And here's what I want you to see, that part of what's going on here is that we get to see the brokenness of the world as it works itself through the real life scenarios and the real life people of Abraham and his family. And, and again, the idea here isn't that God condones or blesses or accepts or approves of everything that happens. But, and, and this is part of why the Bible has for so long been so powerful in the lives of people is that it gives an honest assessment of how the world really is. And think about this. If you were trying to kind of uphold Abraham as sort of this perfect father of the faith that you would emulate uh, at all costs, you wouldn't say, oh, by the way, Abraham didn't trust God. He went down to Egypt. Then he basically let his wife be in the harem of Pharaoh so that he could save his own skin. Like, you wouldn't make up those stories about Abraham if you were trying to just make this polished character that everyone wants to follow. So, it's a real story. And I think that's why it so connects with us, because it shows the reality of sin as we live it. Because guess what? The world hasn't changed a whole lot. In some ways it has, but in some ways we live in the same post-fall world that Abraham and his family lived in. And so we get to see that. Yet, and here's what's so amazing, you go from generation Abraham to generation Isaac to generation Jacob to generation the 12 sons, and through it all, you see people who are cowards, you see people who are faithless, you see people who are murderers, you see people who are oppressive, you see people who, uh, you know, just horrible, horrible, horrible. But what is the consistent theme through it all? It's God's faithfulness. The characters rise and fall. If you think of it like a play, God is the main character, no question. One character comes in, then that character goes through all of the trials and circumstances, and then they fade away. Next character, and so on. But God is faithful, and particularly, God is faithful to his covenant, and God is faithful to be working through all of the circumstances to bring about salvation. And that's what I want us to see as we think about Genesis 12 through 50. It's important to remember that every single character is a channel to some degree in God bringing about salvation. And again, connecting it to Genesis 1 through 11 to bring about salvation to the entire world. So I actually just kind of answered this question that I was going to pose to you. So I apologize for that. Uh, how does Genesis 1 through 11 connect with Genesis 12 through 50? Well, it connects by showing us how God is going to accomplish salvation. And this is important, not just for one man and his family, but how that one man and his family is going to be used to reach the entire world, okay? So you think of, think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as channels of salvation, as instruments that God uses. And remember that promise in Genesis 3.15 that a seed of the woman would stomp the head of the serpent. So as we think about this, what are some other connections that you see between Genesis 1 through 11 and Genesis 12 through 50, what are some other connections that you see? And, and this is what we want to try to do as best we can, what do some of these connections, what are some of the things that happen in Genesis 1 through 11 and 12 through 50 tell us about the author's purpose, about what Moses is trying to do in the Holy Spirit through Moses as we read this? What are some things that you just can think of initially before we go any further? Or questions that you have even at this point? What are some things that you see? Come on, somebody's got something so I can take a drink. It's exhausting? And yeah. Yeah. And... And think about this. This is just worth pointing out any time when we talk about something like that. Of all of the things that the author could have given us, I mean, Abraham's 75 when he comes on the scene. Of all the things that he could have given, he only gave these specific things. So as exhausting as this might seem, this is apparently the highlights that he wanted us to know. Okay, Greg, did you, did you say something? 
Oh, Lance? Was it Lance? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and God is doing that, again, and, and what I want us to see is the universal nature of Genesis 1 through 11 ties to the specific family of Abraham through that idea of God working to save the world. The, we could call it the messianic line. We could call it the saving seed. We're going to look at these things in a minute. But I think that's a major connection point that God is working to accomplish redemption. And this story is a crazy story with a lot of curveballs, a lot of drama, a lot of sin, but it's a story of God working this out through humanity, through a fallen humanity, okay? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. And, and by the way, that's what the New Testament writers pick up on when they say, hey, Jewish nation, don't forget that you are, and we're going to talk about this next week with Exodus, don't forget you are chosen to be a kingdom of priests, basically to be a missionary nation that would lead all the other nations to the true God, and yet that's exactly what someone like Jonah refused to do. What Israel was created to do, they didn't accept. They became, you know, they wanted to be God's favorites rather than to be God's vessels of salvation for all the nations, okay? Okay, here's, here's what I want to do. We're going to look at the basic content of Genesis 12 through 50. So if you're like, okay, I, I know these stories, this is going to be kind of a quick overview. And what we're going to do is, is look at the characters that are involved. So first you have Abraham, Father Abraham, right? And it's worth reminding ourselves, by the way, that there are three different faiths that claim Abraham as basically the father of their faith. That's why we call them the Abrahamic religions. That would be Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So Abraham is really important. And uh, as we think about Abraham, okay, God calls Abram. So remember, he first is named Abram. Uh, he calls him as an old man to leave the land of his fathers, to go to the land of Canaan. Abram follows uh, and God establishes a covenant with Abraham, and we've referenced this already in Genesis 12. God says, Abraham, I'm choosing you, and through you, Abraham, all the nations will be blessed. All peoples will be blessed through you. And that's incredibly important because God tells us up front, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, but I'm blessing you for a purpose. Or we could say, I'm blessing you on purpose, so that through you, all nations will be blessed. Okay, and like I said, this is this is in one sense tragic because we're going to have to fly. But I want us to just get in our heads where we're going. Okay, next, so that's Genesis twelve through twenty four. Basically, is the story of Abraham. As you know, Isaac is the chosen son of Abraham. It takes a little bit, a, a little while to get there because of the story of Hagar and in uh, Ishmael. Remember, Sarah can't have a child. This was a very common custom in the day that if you couldn't have a child, you could literally, it says, build a family through someone else. So Abraham basically sleeps with Hagar. She gets pregnant. Ishmael is born, at which point Abraham actually says to God, God, why can't we just use Ishmael? Why can't he just be the one? And God says, no, because you did that through natural means. You didn't trust me. You didn't come to me. You made that plan on your own. I'm going to give you a beloved son, a chosen son. And that, of course, is Isaac. And the whole, the whole climax of the Abraham story is in Genesis 22, whenever, uh, whenever Abraham has to choose, am I going to trust God who tells him to sacrifice Isaac or am I not? We're going to talk about that a little more later, but that's, that's where we're at. Isaac, it's very interesting, much is said about Abraham. Very little is said about Isaac, other than the fact that Abraham says, you need to go to, you know, my father, or the mother's family, you someone who's close to us. He ends up marrying his cousin, all right? And uh, they end up having two children, Jacob and Esau. Isaac, he has a favorite, Esau. Rebecca, she has a favorite, Jacob, okay? And that causes some family tension. So not much is said about Isaac except for the fact, and this is really a funny story, that he unwittingly gives the blessing, which again, think of this salvific seed, salvation seed coming through. So the blessing is incredibly important in Genesis. Who's going to get the blessing? Well, Isaac's got it ready to give to Esau, you know, my boy the one who I love, the hairy man, the manly man. And Isaac says, go kill some meat, make something that I like to eat, come back, I'll give you the blessing. And you remember the story? 
Rebecca says to, uh, she says to Jacob, who's her favorite, you know, kind of a mama's boy in the kitchen a whole lot. She says to Jacob, oh no, I don't want Esau to get the blessing. Go and put on the like goat hair, okay, so that you look, smell, and feel like your brother, okay? Go put that on. I'll make your dad some food. Go have him eat it, then he'll give you the blessing. Well, the whole plan works, okay? Jacob is a deceiver. He receives the blessing over his brother Esau. He then has to run away because Esau wants to kill him. I mean, this is, this is the chosen family, okay? So take it easy on him, okay? But Jacob literally has to flee because Esau wants to kill him, at which point he goes to his uncle Laban, falls in love with his cousin Rachel, uh, but then gets tricked into marrying his cousin Leah. Uh, There's a whole story there. You know, it happens at the wedding night. We don't know exactly why, but he woke up after they were married and realized that he had married the wrong person. Okay. Uh, He had already worked seven years so that he could marry the wrong person, at which point he has to work for another seven years to marry the right person. Or actually, he gets to marry her immediately, but he kind of signs a contract for another seven years. But that's the story of Jacob. He deceives, all right? He marries Leah. He marries Rachel. At that point, okay, this is where the, the sisterly tension comes in because Leah is hated, or at least that's the way that she's described. Jacob's favorite is Rachel, His less favorite is Leah, and yet guess who has all the kids? Leah. Eventually, Rachel says, I can't stand this. She starts having kids. She prays. God grants it to her. She starts having kids. Then they start having a competition. Who's going to have the most kids? At which point, what do they do? They both give their servants to Jacob as concubines so that now not only does he have two wives, but there are two concubines. They all start having kids until eventually there are 12 kids with an obvious favorite, okay? And who is the obvious favorite? You know him, Joseph, okay? Joseph becomes the favorite son, okay? Joseph becomes the favorite son, and yet, uh, through this, Joseph was kind of like the, you know, the punk teenager who was the favorite, and everybody knew he was the favorite. You remember the coat? But of course, that's where the story goes, where they, the brothers at first throw him in a pit. Some of them want to kill him, but then eventually Reuben kind of saves him from that. He was going to take him back home and be kind of the hero. But Joseph gets sold into slavery in Egypt, but it says God was with him. And this is the amazing story of Joseph. He starts out at Potiphar's house, ends up in prison because he's falsely accused, rises in the ranks because he's a man of God who can interpret dreams. And eventually he becomes second in command only to Pharaoh, at which point in this incredible story, uh, he ends up being the, the means. And don't miss this again, because this is a tiny kind of microcosm of what the whole thing is. He becomes what? A vessel of salvation for his people. That through God's intervention with Joseph, the beloved son, God saves his people, okay? And don't miss this, uh, Judah, in, in this random change of events, he receives the blessing to rule. We'll talk about that in a little while too. But the final sign, and this is something that's often overlooked, is that, that Joseph, before he dies, he makes his sons and his family swear an oath that they will not leave his bones where in Egypt. He makes them swear an oath that when God takes you back to the promised land, you will literally unbury me, exhume my body, and bury my bones back in the promised land that God gives us. In other words, God saves them by by bringing them to Egypt so they have food, but then we're not going to stay there, okay? Um, any questions on that basic content? There, I mean, there's a whole lot there. And again, I'm kind of assuming that, that you know that or if there's some things that are kind of fuzzy, you'll look that up and become more familiar with it. There's way too much to cover in detail. But any questions on that at this point? Yes, in, in one sense, I mean, Islam did not come to exist until, what was it, I'm, I, like 600 years after Jesus? Was that when Muhammad lived? Uh, so, I mean, in one sense, the, the, the Islamic faith basically switches the story of Isaac and Ishmael. So they even claim that it was Ishmael that Abraham was required to sacrifice rather than Isaac. And, and they claim, essentially, a lineage, from my understanding, and I, I, I mean, someone can help me with this, but they claim a lineage that comes from Ishmael, uh, and, and so that's how they claim to have kind of a, a, the same right of blessing as the Jewish people claim to have. Yeah. 
Which, by the way, and this is what's interesting, on that point, just briefly, we, we sometimes try to demonize Ishmael and, you know, kind of wild donkey of a man. Actually, like, Ishmael receives blessing from God, and we kind of forget that. Like, he does receive blessing, and at the end, whenever they bury Abraham, guess who shows back up for the burial? Ishmael. Isaac is there. Ishmael is there as well. So there is, you know, basically God says, you know, Isaac is going to be the one in, through whom the promise comes, but there was still blessing for Ishmael because Ishmael too was a child of Abraham. It just wasn't a salvific blessing, if that makes sense. Yeah, Dr. Crowder. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, that's true. And, and we're going to talk about some of the specific brokenness, but it's amazing Abraham is said, and, and we're going to use this as a segue to go to the next part. Abraham is said uh, to have received righteousness from God, or God counted it as righteousness because of his faith, not because of his action, okay? So we're going to get there in Genesis 15, 6 in just a second. The one, uh, Genesis 12 is foundational. This is the initial covenant that God makes with Abraham that's going to be expanded upon okay, in later chapters, but God makes that original covenant in Genesis 12, so that's a key text, but then in Genesis 15, 6, God reiterates the covenant with Abraham. He again says to Abram, you know, you're going to have stars, and, you know, descendants more than the stars in the sky and the sand and the seashore. At this point, Abram's got nothing, but what does it say in Genesis 15, 6? God, or Abraham believed the Lord, and God counted it to him as righteousness, in other words, and don't miss this, this is so, so, so crucial. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press this point. The first five books of the Bible, we're only looking at Genesis right now. But Genesis is the first book in what? The Torah, which is also known as what? The law. So Genesis is kind of the foundation of everything else that comes in the law. But before you ever get thou shalt not, Ten Commandments, Sinai, Mosaic Covenant, before you ever get that, you have a man who was commended and received righteousness from God based upon what? Faith. So even in the Torah, faith precedes and trumps works righteousness. God never says of Moses, he never says of any of the Israelites after Mount Sinai, he never says that he counts them righteous. The only person in the law itself who is said to be counted righteous is a man who has what? Faith. And we're going to talk about this as we talk about New Testament tie-ins, but this is why when Paul looks at the Torah, when Paul looks at the law, Paul says in Galatians 2, through the law, I died to the law. He was saying that the coming of Jesus and the emphasis on faith wasn't a departure from the Old Testament. He says it's the true message of the Old Testament, which is why essentially what Paul says is we should have seen it. It was right there with Abraham, but we didn't. Why? Because we focus so much on commandments and law that we ignored that before there were ever commandments, law, circumcision, the rest, God counted righteousness based on faith, okay? That's foundational, all right? Genesis 17, this is where God mandates circumcision, okay? So this is where the whole idea of the, the Israelites as a set-apart people because of circumcision comes in. He then renames Abraham, father of nations. Genesis 22, this is uh, referred to as the Akedah, the basically the, the going up to where uh, Abraham sacrifices Isaac. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. How could that be moral? So keep that in mind. Uh, but Genesis 37 through 50, the Joseph narrative, and then Genesis 49 through 50, this is a little bit lesser known, but it's very important. Jacob, on his deathbed, blesses his sons, Okay. And the blessings that he gives to them are basically sort of like prophetic of their destinies. Among that is a prophecy in Genesis 49, 6, I believe it is, that Judah will be the one who holds the scepter. 
So the whole idea of the lion of Judah or the one through, you know, that, that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, that prophecy goes all the way back to Genesis 3 as we saw, but also Genesis 49, 6. So that even that line of Judah comes in the Old Testament, even in the book of Genesis, okay? Um, important themes, all right? We talked about this a little bit, God's covenant promises. Covenant is just another way of saying God chooses on his terms, not on ours, God chooses to have a relationship with human beings. He didn't have to. He wasn't forced to. But God chooses to have a relationship with people, and he does so through covenant. That's a binding of God to humanity that's God's prerogative, but covenantal relationship is the essence of everything we see in Genesis 12 all the way to the end of Malachi. And, of course, it comes into the New Testament as well with the New Covenant. The preservation of the saving seed. Think about this. God, again, from Genesis 3 said there's going to be a seed. Well, what's going to happen to the seed? If Ab- think about this. If Abraham goes down to Egypt and he dies, what happens to the seed? The seed dies. If Isaac is slain, what happens to the seed? The seed dies. Well, what happens if Jacob, who receives the blessing, what happens if he dies? Or what happens if there's a famine and all the children of Israel, remember Joseph and all the 12 brothers? If if everyone dies, the seed dies with them. Which again, the, the story of Genesis 12 through 50 is in one sense the story of God preserving this seed through all of the trials and tribulations that they go through. Important theme. Uh, God's providence, this is uh, what Dennis was talking about earlier, God's providence despite human failure. You have, and I mean, think about this. You have horrible people in one sense in this chosen family. You got murderers, deceivers, polygamists, oppressive. We're going to talk about some of these things in more detail. And yet God uses them despite their sinfulness to do what? Accomplish his purposes. God is not limited by human failure. And what's amazing is God sometimes rewards faith even though people have a very, very sullied background, all right? And that's what the last thing is. Genesis, in one sense, is a book of faith. It's a book of faithless people who have faith in God. And even, you know, when the chips are down, Abraham was commended. Why? Not because he was righteous, but because he believed and because he trusted. So the Genesis is a book of faith, and I'll just say it one more time. It's a book of faith that lays the foundation for the entire law, which is why Jesus can come in and Paul can come in and say, if you pull out faith and you still keep the law, you've done nothing. And God is not commending you. God is not impressed that you're following the Ten Commandments if you don't have faith and if you're not walking with him as Abraham did, okay? Problem passages, and this is where I want to spend some time discussing, and if there are others that you know of that I'm not bringing up, feel free to, 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 to bring them up. Um, I don't care which one of these we talk about, so I'm just going to throw kind of all these out there, and we'll go through them as you want to and talk about some of the issues. One of them is Genesis 22. How can God command Abraham uh, to murder Isaac? Okay, how is that, how is that moral? Major issue. Okay, Genesis 24, what about marrying your cousin? And here's, here's why, and again, you wouldn't make this up. Before marrying cousin, Abram himself marries his half-sister. So there's that. Um, you marry your cousins, and the reason why this is so sort of indicting is in the law itself, these marriages would be prohibited. Like the same Torah that describes these marriages prohibits these marriages. At which point, again, we're not saying that God approves of them, but God apparently uses them despite them. So marrying your cousin, uh, Genesis 25 through 30, does God sanction polygamy and slavery? Okay, there are slaves. Apparently God does not free them in those moments. What about Hagar? How do we think about that? Okay, Genesis 34 through 38. Uh, Genesis 34 is uh, basically the rape of Dinah. She's a sister of the 12 brothers. She is raped, at which point uh, is it uh, Levi and Simeon who go and murder, essentially, the clan uh, who had a member that raped her, okay? Genesis 38, incredible passage where you have Judah, uh, his daughter-in-law Tamar. She is basically widowed again and again and again. She marries wicked sons of Judah. God kills them. 
She eventually dresses up, I'm summarizing this, but it's, she dresses up as a prostitute. She seduces Judah to impregnate her, at which point she has a son. And Judah, his conclusion is, she was more righteous than I. Tamar, by the way, makes it into the, the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. How do we understand the, the oppression, the treatment of women in these passages? Okay, so... Um, I mean, there's, we only have a limited amount of time, but I, I want us to think about these things because as, as we think about Genesis 12 through 50, these are some of the things that as we read it, it's kind of like, well, how do we square that? How do we think about that? So are, are there any of those that, that stick out to you that you'd like to talk about? Because I want to kind of leave it to you. I could go through them all kind of one by one, but is there anyone that you're like, I'd really like to talk about that one? Yeah, sure. Or another one Rosemary has. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if you miss Rosemary's question, she said Simeon and Levi were cursed by Jacob in Genesis 49 and 50. So how does he become the tribe that's chosen for priesthood? Uh, good question. I want to zoom out just a second. Uh, and, and notice this. This is something that, again, we don't really think about a whole lot. But Judah was the fourth-born son. Why is that important? Because the first three sons who would have had first dibs on the blessing, they don't get it. Why? Because Reuben's the firstborn. Reuben messed his nest by sleeping with his father's concubine. He's out. Okay? Again, Jerry Springer Marathon. Okay? Slept with his father's concubine. And, and why is that a big deal? Well, obviously, there's, it's bad in and of itself. But also, it was an act. If you're the oldest brother who takes your dad's concubine, it's essentially you asserting yourself, right? It was a power play. At which point, Jacob says, no, you're gone. Levi and Simeon are the next two oldest brothers. And what do they do? They, in vengeance kill this tribe because, because Dinah, who was raped in Genesis 34, is their full-blooded sister. So Levi and Simeon say, you can't do this to our sister. And they basically avenge themselves by, by lying to the, the clan and basically saying, you have to circumcise yourself. Well, after the men get circumcised, they go and kill them all, okay? At which point, Jacob says, no, you, you're men of bloodshed. Uh, you took vengeance in the wrong way, and therefore they are removed. Judah... The fourth-born son, the only thing that distinguishes him, he treated Tamar horribly, okay? Judah is not a good character, but the thing that distinguishes him is that he does seem to repent in some ways and says that Tamar is more righteous than he is. And then in the end, who is it that says to Joseph, I will be a stand-in, we don't have time to go into the details, but he says, I'll be a stand-in for Benjamin. Remember, Joseph wanted to keep Benjamin, but one of the brothers stepped up and said, no, take me and said, who was it? It was Judah. So it was almost like Judah, not a good guy, but begins to repent and at least is willing to, in the end, say, you know what? Despite my past, right now, I want to do the right thing. So God lands on Judah to be the one through whom the promise will come. Why Levi? I have absolutely no idea. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, Levi was the family of Moses. Um, I don't know. Why didn't that disqualify him from being the priest? I have no idea. So, sorry. Uh, I mean, again, what are some things that, that are on your mind with this? I, I mean, I can go through and kind of talk about each one of them individually down the list. But what are some things that are like, okay, it's just really hard for me to understand how to reconcile this. Anything? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, no, and I, I actually think that's exactly the point. I think, and feel free to disagree with me, but I think what God is trying to do, because remember, 
we got to remember this. We look at God with the fullness of revelation behind us. We know the cross. We know Jesus. We know the whole Old Testament. Abraham didn't know that. Like, Abram trusted God, but he didn't know the full character of God. For all Abram knew, well, this God is powerful, he's the creator, but maybe he's bloodthirsty like all the other gods. Maybe he's just like Baal, or maybe he's just like Molech, and at the end of the day, you know, he's just a more powerful but evil deity who just, you know, does what he wants. I think the point of Genesis 22 is God emphatically saying to Abraham, essentially, Abram, I require no less devotion than the other gods, but at the end of the day, they require blood, they require sacrifice. I am the God who does not require those things. In fact, I'm the God who will save those victims by substituting something in their place. Um, In other words, I think the whole thing was to emphasize the true character of God, which is to say, I am not the kind of God that requires you to give your son. I'm the kind of God who replaces those sacrifices with the true thing that will please me. Um, And that may not be completely satisfying, but, but God was never going to actually make Abraham do it. It says that in Genesis 22 at the beginning. It says, God did this to test Abraham. Are you as loyal to me as even those people who would give their own children? Yes, Abram was, and he proved it. But God wanted to emphasize to Abram, yes, you have to be just as loyal to me, but I am not like those gods. And Abram, I never, ever want you to forget it. I don't want your son to forget it. I don't want generations to forget it. I'm the God who provides the substitute so that the very requirements that I have, I fulfill. I think that's the point of Genesis 22. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that's where we're going to get. Uh, I think this is on like the second to last page. God's covenant with Abram is a unilateral covenant, which means it's not, Abram, you do your end and I'm going to do mine. Like, you know, it's not like, Abram, you do this list of 10 things and then I'm going to bless you. It was God saying, I am choosing you. And in Genesis 15, here's literally what God does. He puts Abraham to sleep. He divides up an animal, and this is the ancient Near Eastern culture's way of making a covenant. It's as if to say they, they literally cut an animal in half. They put one side on uh, one half of the animal on one side, one half on the other. They walked through the middle of the animal, and it was a symbolic way of saying, may, this, may the same thing that happened to this animal happen to me if I don't keep my end of the arrangement. Now, most of the time, there would be two parties in the covenant where both would split the animal and both would walk through. There's a, there's, it is basically a contract obligation. You do your part, I'll do mine. Instead, what God does in Genesis 15, he literally puts Abraham to sleep. He, through a symbolic means of like a fiery torch, okay, he walks through the animal as if to say, may this happen to me, If I don't fulfill my promises to you, at which point, again, the whole point is God will provide the very thing that he demands. And Abraham believes him because you can't earn God's favor. And Abraham receives it because God is faithful even when Abraham's not. Yeah. Any other of these that you want to spend maybe a little bit more time on? I lost my phone. I don't even know what time it is. So uh, let me check. 6.30. 7.14. Okay. Yeah, Rayon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, that could, that could be part of it. I think, you know, the reason why they married within the family and the reason why that was so important to Abraham, remember the story of Abraham sending a servant saying, don't find anyone from the people of this area, find someone from my family that he can marry. The reason they wanted to do that was so that they could basically remain faithful to the God that their family served, right? And this has an echo later on. Don't intermarry later Israel. Don't intermarry with the Canaanites because why? You're going to end up worshiping the Canaanite gods if you do. Um, in other words, so I, I, I agree. I, I don't think the point is that interbreeding is the best genetic course to take. Uh, but at the same time, it was the preservation of our worship of God is the most important consideration. Um, and it was, you're right. I mean, this was early, uh, early on, you know, in sort of the history of redemption. It was a lot closer to the flood and all the rest. So, yeah, there weren't maybe the genetic concerns that would later come into come into play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a biologist either. So, I, I, you know, it, it seems weird to us, and it especially seems weird because it's later prohibited. But the reality is they wanted to preserve faithfulness, and that's why they married, even within Israel. Like, eventually, I guess that would be a problem within Israel itself, you know. Um, but, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. Because in the Old Testament, God is guiding his people gradually, intentionally. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So what Bob said is, can't we say the central theme of the Old Testament is the cross? Yes, for there to be someone who can stand in the place of all of these fallen men and women and pay the price that they owe to God, but that they don't have the ability to pay to God. That is essentially what the cross is. The cross, and, and this is, I mean, it's amazing. Genesis 22 is a picture of what? One chosen son standing in the place of another chosen son, right? It's a, it's a precursor, right? It's a foreshadowing of the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world or the goat who provides the sin sacrifice that Abraham even says to Isaac, God himself will provide it. Which is, again, what's so fascinating because when you think about Genesis um, or, or even you could fast forward to Joseph where Joseph says to his brothers at the very end of the story, what you intended for evil, God intended for good so that many people might be saved. You have this, you know, we could call them shadows or we could call them types all the way through that then as we get to the New Testament, that makes the cross that much more beautiful and recognizable because it's not a sudden departure from everything the Old Testament taught. It is the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament taught. Absolutely. Um, very briefly, I want to talk for a second about uh, the treatment of women. And, uh, and really uh, what I want to do is is give us a principle. So I'm going to skip to this next part, and then we'll have some more time for questions in just a minute. Um, here's, here's some principles to consider. When we think about how God interacts in these texts, God's pleasure or God's blessing, God's favor in these texts does not mean that God is pleased with every aspect of behavior that the patriarchs or matriarchs do, okay? Including polygamy. Yeah, we see that from the very beginning. So God's pleasure in these texts is never a total pleasure that's divorced from the reality of the fall. In other words, and again, you have to read Genesis 12 with the foundation of Genesis 6, 
Genesis 6 says, all inclinations of the thought of the heart of man are only evil continually. After the flood in Genesis 8, God says basically the same thing. All humanity is wicked to its core. And yet, I love them so much, I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to still work on them. But I'm going to do so knowing that they are going to do wrong things. Think of it like this. Jesus, Jesus talked about this in the New Testament, right? Because of the hardness of your hearts, God said X. God said Y. It wasn't because this was how it was intended. It's not like God is somehow commending these things, but God, working within the real-life situation that he has, is working with real-life failures who have real-life sin, and yet God is working to conform them. And, and you might say, well, why does God do it the way he does? Why doesn't God come down and say, well, of course you can't do that to Dinah, or of course you can't treat women like that. There are times that he does. There are times that he does. I mean, literally, what did he do to Onan, the person who would not, would not have a kid with Tamar? He kills him. He said, what Onan did was evil in God's eyes, and he killed him. Does that mean that Tamar was squeaky clean and totally righteous? No. But was she more righteous than Onan? Yes, she was. God does that. But, but here's my point. As we think about the Old Testament, we cannot ever forget that the reality of the fall is still in play. Okay? Let's, let's build on that for a second. One of the biggest mistakes that we make in reading the Old Testament or the New is assuming that statements of God's pleasure... His delight or his or approval is a blanket statement of everything that a person does. Let me give you an easy example. David, he's a man after God's own heart. Murderer, polygamist, adulterer. Is it too strong to say that he used his power to influence Bathsheba in a form that we could see as rape? He was a man who the Bible in one sense says there were aspects of his life that pleased God. He was a faithful man. He was a man who wouldn't let Goliath stand up and defy the armies of the living God. But nowhere does it say that God gave a blanket approval. A man after God's own heart, that's approval, but it doesn't approve of everything. Of course not. At which point God takes the people that he has to work with, the real broken people, but sometimes what we do is we forget that, hey, the fact that God allowed polygamy or, and this is a little bit hard, the fact that God blessed Leah and Rachel and the two concubines to keep having children doesn't mean that God was okay with polygamy, okay? God is working with the situation he can to bring about the best outcome, but guess what? There are people who are intending to do evil, but God uses them so that ultimately good can result. And what is the good? The good is ultimately that the salvation would occur, that Christ would come. And this is what's amazing about Christ. Christ is literally the only character in the Bible who you can look at his life and say, there's nothing that you could possibly say did not please God. He's the only one who's never sinned, which is why you go down the list. Jesus' treatment of women. Jesus' treatment of the poor and oppressed. Jesus' treatment of Jewish and foreigners, right? I mean, go through it all. There are areas where all of these biblical quote-unquote heroes fail, but Jesus never does, which is what sets them apart. So we cannot think that God's commendation or approval in any given moment means that he gives a blanket approval or somehow washes over other sins, okay? Instead, again, God's interaction with humans assumes the sinfulness of humanity. It all takes place under the umbrella of human depravity and the necessity of progressive sanctification. Big idea, let, let's give an analogy, and I hope this is helpful, okay? Think of a surgeon. H have you ever known someone who has had so much wrong with them? Maybe they're in a car wreck or maybe they're in a tragic accident where it's like, you know, they have to have 30 surgeries, Okay? Well, it takes a master surgeon not just to know what needs to be fixed, but also to know in what order it needs to be fixed. Okay, so if everything is broken and shattered, you have to have someone who looks at it, knows what's wrong, knows how to fix it, and knows the order in which to fix it. 
It has to be done in the right way and in the right order. And we could even take it a step further. And what's the first step in healing any patient? You have to convince them that they need surgery. You've got, some, you've got humanity that is broken, broken, broken in a hundred different ways. But before God ever gets to work, and truly not, because God is always working, but God has to get them to the point where they are like Judah, where they know they need him. So God is all the while doing these things. And we can look at it and say in question, well, God, why weren't you more clear at this point about how you would treat these people? Or why would you do it this way? Or why would you do it in this order? At which point, sometimes we have to back up and say, listen, it may not make sense to us, but somehow, as God looked at this totally broken situation, it was almost like he had two choices. He could either do away with everybody, because after all, they're broken. They stand in judgment. They chose this. It wasn't God's plan. But instead of just dismissing them or throwing them away, God said, okay, if you really want redemption, and not if you want it, but if I really want to redeem these people, I've got to bring them to the point where they are, and again, progressively sanctified so that they can receive the healing that only I can give them, okay? I think that's incredibly important. Um, very briefly, I'm going to go through these couple things, and then we're going to talk Covenantal connections, we already talked about this. Covenant is incredibly important, all right? That's enough. We're going to talk about that a lot. New Testament echoes, again, I talked about this earlier. Paul looks at Abraham and says, listen, Galatians 3, Romans 4, Abraham is the father of even Gentiles who come to Christ. Why? Because they are his children by faith. And this is such an important theme because in the New Testament, the Jewish people often would say, well, we're children of Abraham. We're children of Abraham. Paul comes and says, listen, biologically, you may be his children, but if you truly want to be a child of Abraham, you have to be a child through faith. So Paul will say it like this in Romans 1 and 2. He says, not all those who are circumcised are truly circumcised in heart. And by the way, where did Paul get that? Jeremiah, Isaiah. Paul didn't make that up. It's in the Old Testament where he says, listen, you can be Abraham's children biologically all day long, but if you don't have the same faith that he had, then it will do you no good. At which point, again, Paul is saying not we jettison the Old Testament or we unhitch it. Paul is saying you have to understand the Old Testament, including how faith is so foundational even to the law itself. Through the law, I died to the law. And Abraham was the greatest example of that, okay? So when you see echoes, Galatians 3, Romans 4, what Bob said, the cross narrative, Genesis 22, and really, honestly, the entire New Testament, right? How does the New Testament echo Genesis? It all does, okay? So any, any final thoughts or questions in the two minutes that we have left? Anything that's like burning or you want to talk about before we, before we end? Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, Melchizedek, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Melch and this is, this is amazing. He brought up Melchizedek. I'm glad you did. It, it, Hebrew 7 brings up Melchizedek, right? Melchizedek literally means king of righteousness. Melchizedek is a king who is also a priest, but he wasn't Jewish, right? So you've got a foreshadowing of Christ where you have a king who is a priest who also worships God most high. And basically Hebrews 7 says that Jesus is a high priest, but also a king who's in the order of Melchizedek. So yeah, you have the entire Old Testament, even from the very beginning, with shadows and signs and pointers to the coming of the Savior, as if to say, and this is, this. I'm going to go back to this, we're going to end right here. I'm going to go way, way back. I may not be able to find it. But you remember that statement about Joseph and his bones? Yeah, there we go. Final sign. Genesis is an incomplete story. It literally ends with Joseph saying, by the way, don't leave my body here. Talk about a cliffhanger. If he says, don't leave my body here, what does that imply? There's more to come. And this is, this is the trajectory of the Old Testament. It is propelling us toward 
a, a story that has yet to be complete. So you have all these shadows, Genesis 12, Genesis 14, Genesis 3, Genesis 48 and 49, and all, all of them that are pointing forward and pointing forward to the end of the Old Testament, which is essentially to say, where's the Messiah? Where's the salvation? Okay, we're out of time. So if you'd like to talk, uh, I'd love to stick around and, uh, and talk some more. But next week, we're going to be hitting Exodus, okay, as we continue to build the foundation of everything we talked about tonight. All right. Thank you.